if you miss the upper body section of the course, that's okay. You'll probably have enough information in this course to be able to do everything, but there's going to be some underlying concepts like uh, archetypal positions of stability that I'm not really going to talk about too deeply in this class, right? Uh, Rad recorded the last one. It's available on YouTube. So that could clarify some of the vocabulary if it's necessary. So essentially, the situation that we're in is we're all forced to take an extended break. And we've all more or less engaged in varying levels of physical activity. Uh, it's a pandemic. We're trying to survive it. You know, and for some people that it's included exercise and for some people that hasn't been. And uh, regardless of where your body composition is at right now, you know, you survived a pandemic. Like that is takes priority. But the thing that I want you to be concerned with when you're returning to physical activity is you have to be concerned with your mobility, right? Have you become stiff uh, or inflexible over the past year of sitting down too much, basically? So if you if your sport opens back up this weekend and you try to jump in and go as hard as you can and practice four days a week and try to like make up for lost time, but you're also stiff from an extended break and sitting down too much, that's all going to result in a lot of injuries. You'll be right back where you started, right? Not being able to play your sport. So that's basically the worst thing imaginable. So I want to just put out some information on how to reclaim some of that lost mobility from inactivity. Uh, prior to returning to your sport. So all of this stuff, just to recap, I didn't make any of this up. I don't have formal training in uh, athletics. So I use like a lot of the, the actual terms for it because I've done a lot of research informally, but all of this information is from a physical therapist named Kelly Starrett, right? His book is Becoming a Supple Leopard. Uh, it's a funny title. In addition to being very informative, the guy is also hilarious. So it makes reading his stuff a little bit easier. And I have the rest of his books here that I've read through those as well. Don't worry about these ones. Just we have 50 extra bucks. Get this book. Uh, it talks about archetypal positions of stability. It talks about mobilizing and smashing. It has like uh, prescriptions for like if you have a certain joint that's giving you a lot of trouble or a lot of pain. It has uh, good pictures of all the stretches that I'm about to show you, plus a lot of the ones that I'm not going to go over. I've basically handpicked a lot of the mobilizations that are, I think, are most useful for what we do, and that can be tied to like how my body works. So there may be other exercises in here that will help you more than they've helped me. So it is a good book to pick up. So uh, he is a, a classically trained physical therapist, right? So he's not just some like witch doctor from a CrossFit gym who came up with this stuff. I think he owns his own CrossFit gym and essentially uses that as an injury factory. So he treats everybody when they get out of the CrossFit gym after he's mutilated them with different workouts of the day. So I think that's how he was able to advance the science so quickly, right? It's a pyramid scheme. But get his book, read his book. It's amazing. This is kind of just a high level overview of all of that stuff. So we're going to be looking at prehabbing essentially to prevent injuries um, and how to recover from strenuous workouts, especially the first couple workouts back that you do when you return to your sport. So the concepts that we want to talk about is essentially stiffness comes from sitting down too much in a lot of cases. Um, your body is an amazing adaptation machine and will adapt to whatever you throw at that. But unfortunately, that includes sitting. So when you sit down all day, your hip flexors shorten, right? And it pulls you into this bent over position like this. Um, and it just throws your body into like disarray because you're compensating for shortened hip flexors. So you're leaning over more, you put more strain on your back. Your knees are in a bad position. Your ankles are in a bad position. So it's the sitting that you want to get rid of. And um, so like, I really recommended investing in standing desks. I have two automatic standing desks that like, go up and down, one's for, one's for gaming and one's for work. That's made a huge difference, especially for uh, lower body, right? Because you're like, if your butt was made to be sat on all day, it would look like the bottom of your foot, right? It'd be like all hard and calloused and stuff. Your, your lower body's just not meant to be sat on all day. It's meant just like a short rest, but unfortunately we get indoctrinated 
into city for long periods of time, like through 12 years of school and through office jobs and things like that. So your body adapts to that position. Like if you've ever seen kids like swarm in desks, it's because their bodies and their musculature haven't adapted to seating yet. So step number one, step zero really for lower body mobilization and getting it to uh, be more resilient is to eliminate as much sitting as you possibly can. Um, I have found that like when I first found this book and was trying to reclaim a lot of that mobility, I really had a lot of trouble getting any of that flexibility that I gained through stretching to stay until I removed as much sitting from my day as humanly possible. Um, that doesn't mean you have to stand all day, every day, but you want to try to get some good standing breaks in there and uh, work from a standing desk if at all possible. So we talked about primary and secondary motor pathways in the last one, right? And we talked about how your body has one major way that it wants to move, but it also has a lot of secondary ways that your body will use when it has a mobility restriction or you get really tired, right? So that is important for the lower body because it has to do with our knee flexion. And when we talk about the, we talked about the test retest principle last time, a lot of what we're working with is the bottom of a squat and the bottom of a lunge, right? So uh, your primary motor pathway for a squat, and you don't, I'm not asking you guys to squat, right? I'm not asking you guys to do any of that stuff. I just want to show you like, this is what proper knee function is supposed to look like, right? So you see, so you see how I'm standing straight up right now, right? My knees, most people when they squat, their knees come together like this. And what they're doing is they're hunting for stability because they have a restriction like in their glutes or their, their hips or their hip flexors or their quads or something like that, right? So a lot of people when they squat, their knees come together and that's a secondary motor pathway, right? That's the one that is temporarily strong, but it's really susceptible to injury. The primary motor pathway when you squat is your knees are supposed to track outside, outside of your feet like this, right? So essentially we're looking to protect our knees for the most part. So your ACL looks like two tendons like this, right? And this is a gross over, oversimplification, oversimplification of the system, but your knee needs to track out over your foot, right? So your ACL, it's like two tendons that are parallel like this, right? And when your knee tracks outwards, you kind of twist those two tendons together. So they, they tighten and they're, they're better able to withstand force, right? Whereas if your knee tracks inward and it rotates inwardly, right? With going together like this when you're in a squat, if you take your two fingers, right? And you twist them outwards, you'll feel your fingers get snug and get tight together and it's not gonna fray and come apart. When you rotate inward like this, those two, those two fibers, they shear more and they take a lot more damage when you do that. So essentially what you're looking to do with lower body for the most part is you're looking up to reclaim the motion in your hips to make sure that your knee tracks outward over your ankle. So um, the lunge position, right? You'll see this a lot when people are trying to step in when they're fighting and they hit the bottom of this lunge like this. Let me see if I can get a better angle for you guys. So a proper lunge is going to have your knee out over this way, right? You see how my knee is twisted out over this way. A lot of people, when they're hunting for that extra stability, they have their knee rotated inward like this. And essentially this puts a lot of strain on pretty much all of your major, you know, X, CL, ligaments and tendons. So we need to work on opening those hips back up to be able to get that stable position back. Um, and this is one of the reasons why when you're lining up on somebody to fight, you want your toe pointed at them, right? Because if your toe is pointed across like this, you see when I kind of step in to hit them, my knee wants to track inward like this, which is an unstable position for your knee to be in. Now, unfortunately, like when you're stiff and you've been sitting all the time and not stretching, it gets really difficult to kind of unring that bell. So we have to work pretty hard on opening those muscles back up by hitting these stretches. So I'm gonna show you guys all of these ones. Um, I think that's a good, 
good overview of that stuff. So when we talked about archetypal positions of stability, primary and secondary motor pathways, I don't want to spend too much time on that because that was in the last class. And again, that's been recorded by Rat. That's available on YouTube. So if you need to hear that again, um, that video is available. But essentially what we're doing is we're trying to get back to that primary motor pathway by opening up those muscles, opening up those joints and getting our correct lunge back. Um, you can use secondary motor pathways that internally rotated knee, but it's like driving your car without oil, right? You can do it for a while, but it's just not gonna heal at the same rate that using the primary motor pathways do. Um, we talked about upstream and downstream. So when we're trying to resolve an issue in a joint where it feels tight, just as a recap, like if we have um, a tight knee, right? We want to think upstream and downstream, what's connected to those joints. So um, if we're having an issue like in the front of our knee, we might start with like trying to stretch our quad out. We might also look downstream and try to think about, okay, well, maybe I can stretch out the front of my shin a little bit because there is some muscles that run in the front of the calf like that. Um, if you're having trouble with your hip, you can think about like trying to mobilize your core a little bit, but we want to especially look at mobilizing the glute, um, the adductors, abductors, and your hip flexors in the front. So you look upstream and downstream when you're trying to resolve a joint issue. And remember like this is basically, if you have pain, right? You don't want to goof around too much trying to stretch to like fix it. You definitely want to get a doctor to look at something if you're having like burning or instability or it's like um, really giving you a lot of trouble. But if you're having something like where you're like, oh, this is getting a little bit sore. Uh, I don't think this is smoked, but man, this gets tired. This feels stiff. This doesn't feel like it moves like it ought to. That's the kind of stuff that we're trying to resolve. If you have like persistent burning pain and especially like if, you're, if it feels unstable, right? If your knee feels unstable, you need to go to a doctor and get looked at. Like, don't pretend that stretching is going to fix that. Like, stretching may help, but you really need to get into like a real professional, right? None of this is medical advice. This is just, this is more of like a, a personal trainer session than it is like a medical session. So just be aware of that. And then we have the test retest principle. So lower body is easy for a test retest because we're looking at the bottom of a squat and the bottom of a lunge. And what you do is before you mobilize a joint, before you stretch it, before you smash it, uh, before you do that with a muscle, you wanna do a squat just real quick, see how it feels. And then afterwards, you wanna do another squat, another lunge and see how it feels afterwards. Because what this means is if it feels, if that squat feels significantly more easy and more open after, you've done a certain stretch, you found the stretch that you need to do, you found the smash that you need to do. That's why we test retest. So it's very easy to get like locked into like, oh yeah, pec stretch feels good, right? But if you're not doing the right test retest, maybe that feels good, maybe that stretch feels good because it's something that you're already pretty good at, right? But if you test retest and you do like an internal rotator stretch, right? And you get more range of motion. You're able to turn your hand over further. You found out that it wasn't your pec that was tight. It was your internal rotator. So that's how to figure out like, what is my area of tightness? And this becomes very important with lower body because you're going to notice some things sometimes where you're like, if you smash your plantar fascia, like the bottom of your foot with a lacrosse ball, I've had some friends be like, hey, like when I try to touch my toes, I could get a lot further after I rub the bottom of my foot with a lacrosse ball, right? That means that's your general area of orthopedic tension. So that means that's the spot that you wanna look at to resolve. So that's why we do test retest before we do this. I'm not gonna do all that while I'm working on these stretches because I'm not actually going to be hitting them for the minimum amount of time, which is a squat, a lunge, like try to explore the ring of range of motion after your two minute stretch and be like, oh yeah, that, that feels better. Or maybe like, I don't think this, this stretch helped me very much. Because sometimes you don't know if your knee pain is from like, your quads are tight, your hamstrings could be tight, your glutes could be tight. It could be your adductors, like you're basically your groin, right? You have to figure out 
what is the area that's giving you trouble? Like you can get knee pain from like having tight calves and the tight calves are forcing you to a position where you're lunging or squatting that's not uh, orthopedically sound, right? So that's why you have the test retest. It's gonna help inform you of like where are your areas that you need to work on are. So remember test retest and the basic rule of mobility work, and we call it mobility work because some of this stuff is stretching and some of this stuff is like smashing things with like lacrosse balls and stuff like that. So the mobility is kind of like the parent structure for both stretching and smashing. Minimum two minutes. And I find that for lower body stuff, I do three for a lot of these and sometimes like five if I can stand it. Right, but minimum two minutes. If you don't stretch for two minutes and hold it for two minutes, it just doesn't create any kind of lasting change. It functions as a good warm up, but it's not gonna like, it's not gonna affect any permanent change in your tissue. So minimum two minutes. So here's our materials, our recap for materials. You need any kitchen timer, right? I like this one because it's magnetic. You can stick it to a wall or something like that. It's got a little stand in the back. So you can kind of stand it up and look at it. Uh, that's just from amazon.com, any, any egg timer, kitchen timer. And then most of these materials are from uh, Rogue Fitness. They have a mobility section. You just need the stuff that I'm talking about. Don't like get their weirder stuff. It's kind of a cash grab, but these are kind of the minimum materials that you want to use uh, to do some of these stretches. So the first one, is you need three lacrosse balls and a roll of athletic tape. One of the, the, the <clears throat> excuse me, one of the lacrosse balls is just uh, by itself, and the other two, you tape them together like this to make a little bit of a peanut, right? And this is helpful because when we're doing certain mobilizations, certain smashes, we want to be able to lay a bone in between these two balls while the high part of the ball works the muscle, right? Because it needs to, you don't want to smash a bone with the lacrosse ball, it's just gonna hurt, it's not gonna help you. But this helps you cradle certain areas and work certain uh, parts of your joint a little bit more easily. So single ball, double ball. Don't get the, the $80 peanut that they like molded and sell. It's just not quite as helpful as, it's, this is basically just as good. It's gonna cost you like way less and you're gonna lose the thing and they're gonna get mad about it. So the next item you need is the door strap. This just goes as this kind of thick tab. And this is my door that I always stretch on. So it just lets you set a point of any height and kind of like hook it into a wall. This way you don't need to tie the elastic cables to like table legs or squat racks and stuff like that. This is like life changing. I used to think that I would have to go and spend extra time in the gym to be able to do these items. But having the door strap has turned it into like, if I have 20 minutes to wait for someone to show up or something like that, I can just catch 20 minutes of stress without having to worry about my location. I'll definitely get yourself a door strap. And then you need two uh, Rogue Monster Bands. These are just like a, sorry, my toys are getting everywhere. These are just a big, thick rubber cable that you see uh, bench, press bench press athletes use these a lot to like get a variable degree of tension. But this is the 100 pound band from Rogue and this is the 65 pound band. I don't know if they're still green and black. I think they changed the color since I bought these. They last for years to so get the 100 pound and 65 pound. And after I'm done with this, I'm going to be creating like a bill of materials and like a list of stretches as a handout. This is just kind of working through the contents of the course as a test run. So I will make that available to you guys, pref preferably with links and things like that. So the other items that you need, this is just a yoga ball. This is a hard foam ball. Right, it's not like a soft cushy one that you would play in the yard with, it's a yoga ball. So these are cheap, you can get these from Walmart for like five, six bucks. And you need, this is optional, but I like this item a lot. This is a slant board. I saw this in a physical therapy office when I was working on my foot surgery rehab. So this is a adjustable board that you can use to stretch your caps out on. 
You can also do that with just like any yoga block, but I found that having my foot fully supported while I'm trying to stretch my calf is a game changer and makes me way more likely to actually stretch my calf instead of sort of just like stand on a yoga block and jerk around for a little while and not get anything done. So definitely get an This is This is just, uh, this has been really helpful for my ankle mobility over the past couple of years, which was like bad enough for a while to, to require like surgical intervention. So I wish I bought this thing like 20 years ago. And the last item, I think this is the last one. Yes, this is called, I forgot the name of this after I bought it. Schnauzer. Ah, so the name for this item doesn't make any sense, but it's the mobility stick and cradle. I don't know, I'll show you what it is. It's basically a chunk of an Olympic bar. It's knurled, which means it's rough, and a cradle for it, right? So this, when you join these two items together, essentially what you get is a surface that you can roll muscles against like that, right? Um, there's two alternatives to this. This is the mobility stick and cradle. Um, there's two alternatives. The first one that you're gonna see people who are probably a little bit more sane use is a foam roller, right? But I'm a thick boy, so this just doesn't do anything for me, right? It, I can't get deep enough to affect change in the tissues with a soft foam roller. This may be more suitable for your uses. Um, and the other alternative is just any Olympic barbell because you could roll on top of it and you can even position in some ways that you can't do with a mobility stick and cradle. But you'll see a lot of the times people doing Olympic lifts and things warming up by rolling out tissues on an Olympic bar because it's, it's sharp enough to really get in there and affect the change in the tissue. So that's optional. You can use a foam roller, you can use a, uh, a barbell, but I really like this item. It's really great for working on your Achilles tendon, your quadriceps, your hamstrings, and your triceps. I love that thing. And I also hate that thing. It's a very complicated relationship. It is very mean. So the muscles and tendons that we're going to be talking about the most, um, we're going to be talking about your glutes, which is just your butt, your abductors, which are kind of like the side of your hip, your adductors, which are the insides of your legs or your groin, right? And you can remember that being like ad Doctor with a D is adding your legs together. Abducting is moving your legs apart, so basically abducting them away from each other. We're going to be talking about your quadriceps, which is the muscle in the front of your leg. And we're going to be talking about your suprapatellar pouch, which is just all of the insertions of the quadriceps into the knee. We're going to be talking about your hamstrings, which is the back of your leg. And we're going to be talking about your calves, which are in the back here. You have the gastroc, and you have the soleus, which is kind of the middle section, and then you have your Achilles tendon down at the bottom right here. So those are the muscles that we're going to be talking about and focusing on trying to get moving a little bit better in this course. So we're going to start with our stretches, um, and you should probably take notes on this because I'm not going to demonstrate the positions for the prerequisite two minutes, but I'm going to kind of describe like how you move in and out of these positions. And you're going to find that a lot of what we're doing is like we're getting into a basic stretch and then we're kind of exploring different aspects of that stretch by like moving our trunk around right and trying to find tight spots that we can loosen and we're going to be talking a lot about um, contract and release so it's basically a principle that while you're in a stretch if you clench the muscle for about five seconds it doesn't have to be like a hundred percent but if you get like a firm contraction of the muscle for five seconds and then release for 10, you'll find that your body will suddenly like shift positions uh, a little bit. You'll get a little bit more mobility, kind of like instantly, right? Which is a great way for getting limbered up for like a tournament if you only have like a few seconds to do it. So we are going to first, we're gonna start with the hip distraction. So your hip is a ball and socket joint. Remember, we talked about ball and socket joints in the last course with our shoulder, right? And for ball and socket joints, you have something that's called a joint capsule. 
So a joint capsule is basically a fibrous leathery sac that the head of your uh, thigh bone kind of sits in, right? And when we sit on our butt a lot, what can happen is the head of that thigh bone moves forward, right? So if I'm sitting down and the chair is kind of pushing back into me, it's pushing the head of my thigh bone forward like this into the joint capsule. And you can get what's called a hip impingement. It's where the bones are kind of pinching those soft tissues. Like if you've ever squatted down and you feel like a catch, like right here, that's the start of your hip, like being impinged. And it's usually from that seated position that kind of affects that. So the first thing that we work on, usually when I hit, stretch out my hips, as a hip distraction. So I'm hoping I have enough room to show you guys adequately. So I'm going to, I'm gonna be working on my left, my left hip, right? So I'm gonna get down on all fours like this. And I'm gonna lift the weight off of my right knee, right? So you can put it back like this. I'm only kneeling on my left knee right now. And then I'm gonna shift my weight towards you guys, right? And I'm gonna kind of move my body up and down like this. And what you should feel is a stretch just in the side of your hip like this, right? And you hold this position for two minutes and kind of just slowly shift up and down and you should feel different stretches in the side of your hip. And what this is gonna do is, this is gonna drive the head of that thigh bone back into the back of the joint capsule where it's supposed to be again. So if you've been sitting down all day at your job, this is a great simple stretch to kind of get that thigh bone where it's supposed to be again. And I find it is this one isn't as essential for me as the shoulder distraction is, right? Because I find that if I don't do the shoulder distraction first, I'll get like a cramp in my rear deltoid. But this is definitely one that you want to try to start out with, right? So that's the hip, dis hip distraction. You kind of get that on all fours, lift one knee off, lean your weight to the side, and you should feel a stretch in the back and the side of the hip. The second one, I think that this is like, this is in my top three of stretches for fighters, right? Um, this is the modified pigeon stretch or just a glute stretch is what I call it. So let me just move my toys real quick. For this, all you need, this is honestly why this busted old table remains in my home is because I do this stretch on this table. But you can get yourself like a big foam plyo box. It's like a waist high platform, right? But this is how this table keeps its uh, earns its keep is this stretch. So if we're still working on this left hip, we take the side of our leg, we place it like this, right? So that my leg is horizontal across the surface. And I'm gonna keep my back straight. Uh, you've probably seen people do this stretch on the ground before. If you do this on the table, it kind of forces you to have a more honest position, right? I'm sure you guys have seen people do this in the park where they kind of like lay over their leg on the ground like this. You don't wanna do that. You wanna keep your torso straight to make sure that you're getting maximum tension in your glute. And you're just gonna lean forward like this. It helps to keep your head up. And one of the most amazing bonuses, in my opinion, about lower body stretching, is a lot of the time is hands-free. So some of my best flexibility days when I was playing Animal Crossing and I was doing my leg stretches while I was jamming on pain, Tom Nook is his rent back, right? So. We're gonna lean our chest forward like this, and you should feel this. I'm gonna switch legs, I think it'll be easier for you guys to see. So right leg, you should feel this back here in your butt, right? And your butt is a really thick, tough muscle. So this is a stretch that you wanna hold for probably longer than two minutes. It honestly takes me a good three to start feeling anything when I do this stretch. And you wanna kind of contract and release. So I'm kind of just, pushing my leg down into the table to get that contraction, right? And then when I release, I find that I have a little bit more range of motion. And the other ways that you can modify the stretch, and this really illustrates the concept of you need to hunt around for stiff positions. So it's not enough, right, to just lean forward. You wanna kind of shift your body to the outside to see if you can get a different stretch in a different position. You can shift your weight to the inside by leaning to your left to try to get a different aspect of the hip stretch. Now, I really like to spend one minute in each position 
kind of just hunting around for like, where does my glute feel stiffest today? Like, how can I do maximum? How can I experience maximum discomfort on this stretch? And this one is really critical because this tends to be the biggest limiter for that outside knee rotation when you hit that squat or when you hit the bottom of that lunge. This is one of the quickest ways to get that internal knee rotation back is that modified pigeon stretch, just a hip stretch, table strip. Yeah, it's, it's pretty, it's, the name is not super important, but this is definitely in my top three of like stretches that you need to do probably daily to try to reclaim that motion. The next one is the table adductor stretch. So this is for your groin. Um, I want you guys to be careful with your knee here. Don't force it to be really deep. And if you feel any tension in your knee, don't, don't go into the pain cave. Your spirit animal is not waiting for you in there, right? You should just feel like a good stretch. You shouldn't feel pain, right? If it feels sketchy, it probably is sketchy. So the table adductor stretch, so I'm facing you guys. I'm gonna lift my leg up to the table here. I'm gonna to try to straighten my core like this. And you should feel a stretch on your adductor on the inside of your thigh here, right? And if you wanna contract and release, you can push down with my knee down into the table. Now hold it. And you see how I kind of popped up just a little bit straighter for having done that. But what you wanna watch is if you're getting discomfort on the side of your knee, you're probably pushing too hard or you may not be ready for this stretch yet, right? That's your, I think that's your PCL on the inside of your knee. If you get tension there, don't do this one. There's other adductor stretches. This is just a really easy one to do at the park because there are often picnic tables there. Just take your friend's stuff and throw it on the ground and be like, hey, I'm gonna stretch my groin on this table. So this is a table adductor stretch. Again, hands-free, you'll play Animal Crossing on this boy. It's a good position to be able to reclaim that, uh, especially deep lunges and things like that. So, and when you get off, when you get out of this stretch, don't just like kind of drag your foot off, give yourself a good lean and take your leg off that way. Don't force yourself through uh, too much of a range of motion. Let me check the chat real quick for a question. MCL, MCL is the inside of the knee. Sorry, thank you. It's good to have that training in this class. All of the CLs kind of blend together into just the mysterious galaxy that is your knee and this injury prone nebula of just ruining people's athletic dreams, but your MCL is on the inside. Thank you. So the next one, this is for, this is for your adductors as well. This is a safer alternative, in my opinion. I don't ever feel strain on my knee. It's also the least flattering stretch in the entire world. So maybe just do this one in your apartment. But this is the banded wall squat. And it's probably the most effective adductor stretch. But we're gonna take our 65 pound band and we're gonna wrap it around one knee and we're gonna pass it around behind my back and wrap it around the other knee. And what this is going to do is this is going to put consistent tension on my legs to open and I'm going to feel a stretch in my groin. And essentially I'm trying to get my butt as close to the wall as possible, right? In like the deepest imaginary squat. And the reason I'm explaining this to you guys this way is I'm going to be doing this against the wall. So it's a little bit harder to see. So getting down into this position, I'm assuming, yeah. I'm going to take one end of the band, I'm going to wrap it around my knee about like this, right? I'm going to pass it around my back and I'm going to wrap it around the other knee. So, looks like this, right? With the, the band is going around my lower back. And then I'm going to move my butt as close to the wall as I can, kind of flip up like this and my bottoms of my feet and my butt are against the wall. And I'm just gonna let this band kind of open my legs up. And the contract and release portion of this is you can put your elbows against the inside of your knee. You can squeeze a little bit for five seconds and you should feel your groin open up just a little bit more. And ideally, you wanna get your heels as close to your butt on the wall as you possibly can because that's the deepest part 
of a squat, right? So this is another one, since it does both sides of your body at the same time, you really wanna hold this one for like three minutes or four minutes or something like that for a little bit longer. But this is another one to be able to get a state of comfort in the bottom of a lunge, right? Having a tight groin is a really good way to ruin your knee. So it's definitely something that people need to work on. And in addition, like how often do you express this position in your daily life, right? Like how often do you hit this wide open position? So this is a really important one. It's not my favorite, but again, hands-free, play video games on a switch. So no particular instructions on how to get out of that mess. Gotta just fumble your way out. So after that is the external hamstring stretch. You can use the table for this again. This one, I'm gonna place the side of my ankle. So my heel goes up. And I'm gonna rotate my knee out like this so that the side of my ankle is rested. And you see how my leg, it's not straight right now, right? It's bending about, um, I guess it would be about 120 degrees, right? So I'm gonna lay it down like this. Don't push down on your knee for this. That's not what I'm doing, right? I'm going to try to just straighten my leg a little bit and lean forward. Now, I'm not putting weight here, I'm just leaning forward. And what this stretch hits is the outside aspect of your hamstring. It's right next to your ACL. It's another position that you, basically if you kind of shorten that tendon and shorten the musculature surrounding that tendon, it gets really difficult to be able to open your knee again when you are trying to hit that squat position. So I'm just leaning forward and trying to straighten my leg a little bit. It's getting to like not quite 180. This is probably 160 degrees. I'm not pushing down on my leg. I'm just leaning forward and keeping my core as straight as I can, right? So it hits the outside aspect of the hamstring. You kind of need multiple stretches to get your hamstring um, as mobile as it should be because it has a lot of surface area. So that's the external hamstring stretch. So again, just take your table. Put your foot, if you need about 120, roll your leg over like this, and just straighten the leg, lean forward slightly. Don't put pressure on your knee, because that's gonna be on your ACL, you don't wanna put pressure there. So that's another easy one that you can do at the park when you're, you know, there's a picnic table or something like that. You could just catch a stretch like towards the end of the practice. So the next hamstring stretch is the banded hamstring stretch. So we're going to take our door strap and our 100 pound cable. And don't like look at me and be like, oh my gosh, Tato's a monster. I'm gonna get the 45 pound band. You just won't move as far. You need the heavier band to do this, right? You're not gonna step as far away from the door. But we're gonna take our door strap. This is why I'm not sure if the camera angle will work, but I think it will. We're gonna put this in about about waist level, right? And stick it in the door. We're gonna put our 100 pound cable to the clip. And then we're gonna pass our leg through the band, right? It's gonna be right next, right up next against my groin, right? And I'm gonna step forward to get slack, to take out the slack here, right? And I'm keeping my back leg straight. And you can rotate your back leg out if you want to, but you just don't want to like bend your knee. And you're gonna keep your core straight. You're just gonna bend down like this. And what this does is this pulls the head of your thigh bone back into the back of that joint capsule and makes it a lot easier to get a deep stretch in your hamstring than just trying to do this manually and like bend over and touch your toes. So again, like the modified pigeon stretch, this is a good chance to like explore different regions of tightness by moving our core in different directions. And to contract and release, you can clench your leg a little bit like that. You can free up motion. Another way to do that is to relax your back a little bit. Just bend your knee forward like that to take the tension out of it and then sink back in. And you might notice you have a little bit more range of motion in the hamstring from that one. So this is definitely another top three stretch Tight hamstrings are definitely one of the reasons why people lose their, their mess up their knees. In addition, if you want to hit the outside aspect of your hamstring and you didn't like the other stretch or didn't follow how it was done, I could take my, yes, you can see my foot. I could take my foot and rotate it in 
a little bit, right? And then lean across it. And you'll feel the tightness of the stretch shift outwards and hit the outer aspirin of the hamstring a little bit more hard. So that's definitely the other of the top three whack folk stretches. So that's an important one. If you don't do any other hamstring stretches in a day, definitely do that one, two minutes per side. Depending on the kind of day, I'd like to do that one for three. The next one is the banded hip flexor stretch. So are in the front and they're connected to our quadriceps. So this frees up a lot of motion for, again, the bottom of a lunge forward, right? So this lets us keep a straight core when we hit that bottom of the lunge instead of being forced to lean over like this, which is not quite as stable. Having a hip flexor freedom lets us hit this fully instead of position a lot easier. So this is a really good stretch for like, this can actually improve your lunge distance a little bit because if you can kick back further, you're able to propel yourself with more force forward, right? So door strap, same position as the banded hamstring stretch. We're gonna pass our leg through. This is against, against my groin. I'm gonna back away from the door. Let me see. I'm gonna shift this down. So back away from the door a little bit until it's tight, right? I'm gonna get down on one knee, and this is pulling my uh, this is pulling the head of my thigh bone forward. That makes it easier to hit a deep stretch. I'm just gonna shift my torso while keeping my spine straight forward, like this. So this helps us open this, um, this component of the lunge up this front of the hip. This is also really helpful for when you're trying to stretch out your quadriceps. A lot of the time your position is compromised and the quadriceps stretch because your hip flexor is too tight. And when we sit, this sucker is like at a 90 degree angle all day, every day. So this gets like stale and small and tight really, really quickly. So this is another great stretch to kind of reclaim that position. It's also hands-free video games. Yeah, it doesn't get any better than that, right? The upper body stretches, you can't play games while you do it. The lower body stretches, you can. So two minutes minimum on this one too. That's the banded hip flexor stretch. I'm gonna get out of this, don't try to like fall forward, sit back, and stand up like that. Okay. So this is the couch stretch. And you can do this against the couch, but I think the best version is against the wall, right? This is definitely your number one stretch for almost any sport because this hits everything. But a lot of the times, if you're really tight, it can be really difficult to get into the position for the stretch. And one thing I'll disclose to you guys is I can only do this with my left leg. I need a little help to be able to do this with my right leg, but I'm going to show you guys what that looks like. So I'm going to take my I'm gonna take my socks off because I need a little bit more traction. So if I slip, it's not gonna be very fun. So couch stretch, main quad stretch. Um, there's three versions. You can use a couch, you can use the wall, um, and you can lean forward with your hands on the ground, or you can use some external support. And so to get into position, I'm gonna get down on all fours. I'm going to place my left shin and knee against the wall, right? So this is going to kind of enforce like a 90 degree angle there. And then I'm going to put my right foot, the bottom of my right foot on the ground like this. So for a lot of people, you see my foot back over my head like this. For a lot of people, this is going to be about as good of a stretch as they can get, right? And if you feel like a deep stretch here, like that's sufficient. You don't have to worry about it. Um, if you do this against the couch, like you'll notice, you see how my foot and shin are straight up against the wall? If you do this with the couch, your foot has the freedom to like be perpendicular instead of parallel to the wall, and that can get you a greater degree of stretch in your quad if your shin is limiting how much you can stretch. But basically, the first version is down on your hands like this and pushing forward to open up your hip flexor and your quad, that's fine. But what you're really looking to work towards is putting your butt against the wall like this. You can put your hands on your knee to start. And, you, and as a, I think the end goal is to be able to put your back against the wall, but I don't know if there's any time in my life when I'm going to be able to do that. 
But if you find this to be really difficult, it's also acceptable to get some support by like putting your hand on a table um, or like a dumbbell right here. I tend to need to do that for my right leg, but this is definitely a top three stretch. Um, this is important for runners as well. And this is gonna open up your hip flexor, your quad, your ankle, it hits everything. So that is the couch stretch. That's another one that I tend to hold for like three minutes to make sure. Um, and if you're having a lot of trouble getting into the position, it really helps you do the hip flexor, the banded hip flexor stretch first. You just give yourself a little bit more mobility and that can allow you to hit your quadricep a little bit more effectively with that stretch if your hip flexor is limiting your ability to get into that position. And there's two more stretches. So the last part that we're looking at for stretches are calves. So we just take our slant board. You don't have to put it at a super aggressive angle like that, right? You can just put it on the lowest angle and just step step forward past the slant or a little bit further, right? You don't have to make it aggressive if you don't want to. So you just stand on it. I like to put my hands on the wall and I lean forward a little bit. You can see my slant board is a little bit precarious because I've worn some of the sandpaper off of it, the grip tape. And you can see I'm taking my right foot and kind of stabilizing a little bit here as well. So that hits your gastroc, but your knee is straight. When you bend your knee a little bit, it shifts the stretch down and you hit your Achilles tendon a little more. And again, you can hunt around by leaning to the side, leaning to the inside to find different parts of your calf, your soleus, your Achilles that are tight, right? So this is another one. I think this one takes a lot more time than two minutes. Like I'll do this one for five minutes sometimes, just get things free again. And then the contract and release, it's just, you kind of push with your foot down against the board and then relax. And you should get a little bit more mobility out of that. So push for five seconds, release for 10 seconds to see where you're at. And then the last calf stretch is the Peronius stretch. So this is one you can do anywhere. It's going to be a little hard to see, but essentially what I'm doing is I'm rolling my feet out onto the outsides of my feet, right? And you'll feel a stretch in your peroneal tendon, which is down the side of your calf. And your peroneal tendon is important because it expresses the function that moves your ankle out like that, right? So anytime you're trying to step off your foot, your peroneal tendon is active trying to keep your foot from buckling out like that, right? So you need to stretch that. So you just roll over onto the sides of your feet. And I like to lean against the wall, I'm over on the sides of my feet, keep my hips straight and my back straight, and just lean forward a little bit like that. It gives you a real deep stretch into the peroneal tendons. You can hunt around a little bit but what you're really doing here is putting more pressure on the left or right side. So I think it's best to just kind of stay straight. So that's the last stretch. So we're gonna talk about different smashes and this won't take very long, maybe 10 to 15 more minutes and then we'll have time for questions. So smashes, they're used for working out knots, right? This is essentially, this isn't magic. This is basically doing trigger point massage to yourself. So if you find an area where you're exploring with a yoga ball or a lacrosse ball that feels particularly sensitive, or you feel like a delocalized pressure down the muscle, you've probably found a trigger point and you need to work that out. So you can just, basically the smashes for your lower body are pretty simple. So we're not gonna spend tons and tons of time on this. But the first one is a glute smash, right? So you need a larger ball for this. If you don't want to get a yoga ball, I think a soft ball can work if you get some athletic tape around it to give us some grip. If this couldn't be simpler. We're just going to sit our stupid butt cheek on this ball. And we're going to roll around and try to find tight spots. We're like, oh my gosh, that sucks, right? So a really common one is that outside of the glute, like we're in the high position 
and one on the outside is just, I can barely talk because that's very tight, but we're basically just rolling back and forth and kind of just massaging that knot out, right? And if you want to hit the different part of your glute, like closer to the inside, we're going to put our hand, I'm sorry, our hand, our leg across our knee like this and roll back and forth. So this is a really good way to reclaim that bottom of the squat motion. You just massage out your butt, man. I know it sounds a little bit silly, but glutes get very stiff and it's very likely to mess up your knees if you have tight glutes. And one way that you can tell if your glutes are tight, if your feet are rotated outwards like this, when you stand and you walk forward like that, unless your foot is physically attached and you're like, um, it's not pigeon toe just in, I forget what out is, but in most cases where your feet are rotated out like this, your glutes are tight, like it's unfortunate, but it's true. So one of the test retests you can do is just, hey, where does my foot sit when I stand after I finish that smash and be able to move across like that. So I'm gonna show you the positions. So I'm rolling it here. This is my thigh bone. I'm rolling it here, just under the head of that hip. I'm rolling it to about right inside and then down low. This is the position where I would hit with my leg across my knee. That's your glute smash. That one is unflattering, but extremely important. And then the next one for a patellar pouch smash. So that's where all of the insertions in your quadriceps go into your knee. And we are going to take our lacrosse ball. We're going to lay down on the ground and we're going to roll this guy across all of those insertions. We're going to move our leg back and forth like a lever, right? Lay down on the ground. I'm sliding that lacrosse ball just below my knee. I'm putting all my weight on it. I'm going to move my leg back and forth like this. And you can also put some weight into your elbows, just kind of drive more weight into it. And you can roll back and across. And you might feel like some gross ropey knots as it slides back and forth across your quadricep insertions. Might get really nasty. Is why my voice is quaking a little bit when I do this. But this is a really good way if at the bottom of the squat, your knees are pinchy. This is a really good first stop to try to resolve that issue. But we'll just go back and forth like that. And we're rolling internally and externally. And the area that I'm hitting is right across here above the knee at the head of the quad. The other ones that you can do, oh, uh, there's a quad smash. Now this is the DEF CON 5 version where we use a mobility stick and cradle. And this really hurts, but this is really great for your upper quad and your mid quad, right? I was thinking with the super patellar pouch smash, I was working the lower part of my quad. So I'm usually working mid and high with this one. So we have our mobility sticking cradle on the ground. And we're just gonna lay down, drive the front of our thigh into it. And we're gonna try to put our weight up on our elbows and get as much weight as we can. And we roll back and forth. We're gonna flex and extend our quad like that. And it's really hard to talk when I do this one because it sinks in extremely deep. But this is a really good way of freeing up some motion. You can also do your hamstring with this. It's a little bit more difficult. You can roll back and forth like this, although it helps to have, I'm not going to sit on my table. But if you have a table or a surface that you can kind of elevate this on, or more specifically, you can just do this in a squat rack if you put the bar at a waist level position and you kind of hang your leg over the front, and you, I don't know if I'm tall enough. I'm not really tall enough, but you would roll it back and forth and extend your leg like this, and basically it just tacks the tissue down, and you'll feel a deeper stretch when you do that. It's called a, it's called a monkey bars of death by the CrossFit, by CrossFit people. And then you also have some smashes for the back of your knee. 
So they can hit the assertions of your hamstring into your knee joint. So that's back here. And you have inside and outside aspects. So the inside aspect is over here. And the outside aspect is over here. And you can tell that, and you, you'll feel you'll feel the lacrosse ball hitting your thigh bone, and you can't mobilize there, right? But you can mobilize on the inside or the outside of it. And this one is you just take the lacrosse ball. We're gonna pop it. This is the outside aspect. We're gonna pop it back here. We're gonna put the bottom of our foot in the ground. And we're gonna slide forward like this. So it's in there as tight as you can get. I'm gonna rotate my knee in and out like that. And that can kind of release the tissues in the back of your knee. And you can get the inside aspect in the same way. Just take the cross ball right in the knee right here. Slide forward like that. It disappears basically. You move your leg in and out like that. And I find when I move my leg outside, I get like a really painful massage feeling there. And that can help with um, if you feel some tightness in the insides of your knees, like on the backs of them, this can help free up a little position. And you'll notice that this is smashing my hamstring and it's also smashing the top of my quadricep. So it's kind of getting pulled up, sorry, not the top of my quadricep, the top of my gastroc, right? So hamstring, gastroc, and it's hitting up a little bit of motion in the both of them. And you can also do, you can also do that with the double lacrosse ball and cradle the back of your thigh bone in between. But I'm a little bit thick for that. That doesn't really work for me. I can't really get a good amount of force with both balls at the same time. So I have to use the single one. And so three more. So it's a shin smash. I forget the name of the musculature, but you have some muscles in the front of your shin bone here, right? So you take the double lacrosse ball and we cradle the bone of our shin like this. And this is done against the ground. And we just roll back and forth, right? So we're trying to hit this whole surface here. So we just lay it on the ground, put our shin inside here, roll back and forth. It really doesn't take much pressure to get this one done. So don't get overzealous. We just lightly massage it out. And this is one where if you push too hard, you do too long, your shin will be very sore the next day. But the test retest one for this is you should find that after you've massaged the front of your shin out, it should be a little bit easier to point your foot like that. And then we have three kinds of calf smashes. And you can do this on the ground with a barbell I like to use the mobility stick and cradle for this one. So it's three versions. Well, not three versions, three positions. So we're gonna lay our calf down on the bar. This is a gastroc, it's the high part of my calf. So this is probably one of the thickest muscles that you've got. It's gonna take some time to work this one out. So you can move back and forth like this. If you need more pressure, you can very carefully cross your leg, a little bit more weight. Depends on the day for me to do that one. And you can also roll the inside by rotating your foot inside like that and the outside closer to the peroneus. And if you roll out your peroneus a lot, it can get sore, so be careful with that. It's probably best to just start with the back of it, right? And the third position is your mid calf, which is your soleus. This one doesn't take as much weight, in my opinion, but if you want to cross over to get more weight, you can. It's the same deal. You roll in and out. You can also pin and point your foot, move it up like this. Third position is the Achilles tendon. This tends to take a little bit more weight from it, but you just roll back and forth across your Achilles, and sometimes you'll notice that, you're, notice that your big toe is like involuntary, cur involuntarily curling when you do this, that's okay. Just listen to your body. If it's extremely painful, don't push further that day, right? It, it didn't take you a couple of days to get as tight as you are. It may take longer to undo that damage. So just conservatively roll it across the Achilles. You can lay your foot across and pin, flex, 
and extend like this. And you should notice your test retest is pretty much just the calf stretch. If you do this properly, you should be able to lean your foot a little bit further forward than you would afterwards. And I think the Achilles tendon stretch is a really important one for a lot of people too, because that does tend to get tight and your Achilles tendon can tear um, just like anything else. And it's a pretty painful surgery. And in addition, um, this is really great for people who have some ankle arthritis. I have some buildup in the front of my foot right here. So I can't really get a meaningful Achilles tendon stretch by just using the calf slant. I have to smash it with this one to be able to restore those tissues because I have like a, a limiting factor in the front of my foot there. So, oh, bonus. Last one, you can do a plantar fascia smash. This is very simple to do when you're uh, just standing around. You just take the ball, you put it on the ground, put your hand on a wall, you step on it, just massage the bottom of your foot like that, back and forth across the whole surface and the whole arch. It's a really easy one to help prevent plantar fasciitis, which tons and tons of fighters get, I guess, because of like tight shoes and stuff like that. So that's all the major ones for the lower body. If you guys have questions, I'm happy to answer them for you. Just please put them in the chat. Um, if you guys have comments on the structure of the class, that's welcome. This is kind of my test run before I do this for uh, the SKBC associated event. So if you guys have questions, just go ahead and type them now. I'll give you a couple minutes. So Rat says he noticed that Dalo doesn't Dalos doesn't point his toe. Thoughts on things he may be doing to protect his knee in that context. Uh, that's that's tough because I don't really know why he may be doing that. And um, he does have some medical information that I don't want to disclose. But essentially, when you don't point your toe, um, a lot of the time it's because you don't have an open hip position where you can't extend your knee and rotate your knee out. He may have a tightness issue that he's trying to avoid. Um, there may be uh, one major difference in the mechanics of not pointing your toe forward if you think about it, like if my foot is rotated inside towards the wall like this, and I try to extend in this direction, like I'm trying to throw a shot and reach for it, I bend my knee, my body shifts that way. And what I really want is for it to shift this way. So I want my foot pointed forward and it makes my knee track outside a little bit more easily. So I don't know why he does that. He may have a reason. Um, like a lot of people take those secondary positions of stability because their mobility is limited in some way. And, you know, he's been fighting forever. So he may have something like that. We may just not have that education. So Jamie has a question is how long will it take for someone who hasn't used these techniques or hasn't been as active to start noticing a difference? So when you, it, so it depends on what you mean by difference, right? A lot of these stuff, it also depends on what you're trying to resolve. So for the smashes and things like that, like I notice a difference right afterwards, right? It feels better pretty much immediately. But the trouble is that a lot of those effects will fade over time. Like you'll regain a lot of mobility, but you may only keep like 1% or half a percent of the work that you did, right? So it has to be like a continuous effort. But if you do like some of the, the super patellar's pouch smash, you can reduce a lot of tension on your knee and it may feel a little bit better immediately. But I wanna remind you that like, you didn't get stiff in one day. So it's you're not gonna be able to fix it in one day. So if something feels better immediately, you, what you found is an area that you need to continue to work on. You found uh, the Pareto principle of regaining that mobility. So you need to keep hitting that. Um, as for noticing a difference in mobility, like if you hit it every day, like honestly, I feel better in a month when I'm very meticulous about it. Um, 
if you're very stiff, it may take like, there are some things that I've been working on for years and haven't reclaimed all of it. Like the couch stretch against the wall, like being able to put, being able to not use my hands to support myself on my left leg is new this year. Like that much took years, right? So it depends on like how much are you trying to regain and how much have you lost and how many muscles are involved in the specific motion that you're trying to mobilize. So the answer is, you'll probably feel better the first time, but to notice like a permanent difference where you don't need to continually mobilize, probably like a month or a couple of months minimum. And it can be difficult to stick with. So you definitely wanna find like charts or schedules that can keep you motivated to consistently stick with it. Honestly, like out of all of my programming, like my lifting weights, my fighting, my diet, consistent mobilization is the hardest thing. It may be like my Waterloo of personal fitness because it's it's not fun. It just hurts. It doesn't burn a lot of calories, right? It's not dramatic. Um, it's, you know, it's not entertaining. But like when I'm consistent with it, I don't get injured very frequently at all. However, like since my mo my load is high, right? Like I lift weights and I fight most days. Um, I do a lot of plyometric drills. I do a lot of footwork practices outside. So like, if I don't stay consistent with this stuff, I get injured really quickly and personally. So that tends to be pretty significant motivation. But like, it depends on your consistency. It depends on what you're trying to resolve. And again, like there can be issues where like maybe you don't have mobility in your shoulder because you hammered all the cartilage and it's it's gone. Right, like in those cases, you need to see your doctor. There's no amount of stretching that's going to like restore a torn rotator cuff. There's no amount of stretching that's going to undo your torn ACL or your torn Achilles tendon. Like you need surgery for those aspects. Um, and fortunately, like I'm here to tell you, like I have had a major foot surgery. It's not the end of the world. So it depends. Is the answer. So probably you'll feel a little bit better immediately. Lasting results where your performance is increased. You're not in as much pain afterwards. That could take a couple of months and then permanently restoring a full range of motion when you've lost a lot already, that can take years. So I think that's probably the best answer that I can give you for that. Does that make sense? Okay, other questions? This was great, thank you. I, I know my glutes and hips are always super tight. So I'm going to start working those out. Okay. All right. Well, thanks friends for having me. It was a good time. Thank you for allowing me the, the space and time to kind of test run this class. It was really interesting to think about these things again and try to like organize material and that kind of stuff. So um, thanks again. And if you